everybody's quiet with anticipation. Hope you're ready. It's nice to have a bit of freedom without the cameras. You know, I can digress and talk more personally about different things. But I've been blessed this week uh, to have my son, Seth, off uh, working with us on uh, work experience. And so it was a beautiful opportunity to help him show how I prepare for a sermon. And so we kind of prepared this sermon together. But it's a beautiful analogy is that you can have that opportunity with your children to teach them how to unpack the Bible and the stories and talk about context and all that thing. The Bible can come alive for the next generation. And that's what we want. We want a culture in our society and in our households which brings alive the Word of God in every shape and form. It was interesting, Andrew Gray in the last meeting mentioned an interesting scripture in Revelation chapter 4 about four beasts before the throne of God. And then I think it was about two weeks or three weeks beforehand, I spoke about uh, how scripture was all summed or the covenant was all summed up with that word, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. And as I was reflecting on today, the Lord just gave me a revelation of what is going on in the throne room of God. And I want to talk to you today that the truth be known, there is a spiritual realm. And sometimes we're distracted by what's going on in the physical realm. Our focus is on what we see with our eyes rather than what we see in the spirit. And if you remember an interesting story in the book of Elijah, or talking about Elijah, was he was, or he was with his servant, and as he was with his servant, his servant was so distracted by the army that was coming against them, he had to have the scales removed from his eyes to see the army that was fighting for them. We often talk quite often about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as if they are the only spiritual entities and neglect the fact that it was only a third of heaven that fell. So there are two thirds of angelic presence still fighting for goodness. Evil is outnumbered. God has given the grace for evil to exist. Why? Largely because we are a mixture of good and evil. And God wants to save many before his son returns. And so there is a grace even that that God allows the sun to shine and the rain to come down on the righteous and on the sinner. This is God's grace. Well, let's pick up that scripture that Andrew was talking about. Revelation 4, 6 to 8. Around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Beautiful analogy. Here we find these fantastic beasts around the throne room of God, constantly worshipping God day and night, And their chant and their mantra is the past, the present, and the future. Three-dimensionally, God is in control. Even when you don't feel like God is in control, He is in control. If God was not in control, the earth would have fell off its axis a long time ago, and everything would have been destroyed. Because if Satan was in control, destruction is the aim of the game. But God is a God of order. 
He's a God of light. When he speaks, things are formed and made into complete wholeness. When he breathes into clay, it becomes flesh and rises to life. The dead become the living because of the power of God. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, he's not just the spirit of truth, he is the spirit of life. Breathe into these bones and watch the army arise. So here's these four creatures before the throne. The lion symbolizes lordship, king. Then you have the bull symbolizes strength, power. Then you have the human symbolizes heart. And if you remember a few weeks back, we talked about love the Lord your God with all your heart. And how in the Old Testament there was only three, but the heart included the mind and the emotion. Human beings. And then the last one, which we will be looking at in more detail, is the eagle, symbolizing the spirit or soul. So we see right before the throne room of God is the sense of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But these beasts are not just mentioned in Revelation, they're also mentioned in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 10. And it talks about the cherubim, the angels, who are a mixture of all these animals. And they're on the wheels of God's throne. And he's moving everywhere. And as he moves, the angels move with him in direction. But these cherubim are not just mentioned in Ezekiel 1, chapter 10 either. They're mentioned right at the very beginning of the Bible. When Adam and Eve were cast out, he placed what? At the gateway of the Garden of Eden. A cherubim with a flaming sword. We find also that these cherubim are in the tabernacle. You know, the embroidery that they had on the curtains were of these beasts, with heads of human beings, wings of eagles, bodies of lions, or of bulls. Sacred guardians. But not just on the curtains, they're actually even on the seat of the throne. Because we find the Ark of the Covenant had two cherubim facing each other with their wings forwarding, touching, and it was the mercy seat where God was supposed to have sat in the middle of the Holy Holies. And underneath that mercy seat was the covenant. Often we talk about the Old Testament as old. I don't like that term, Old Testament. I prefer the the, the, the first covenant. Because it is not old, because it says in Jesus, when he's talking about the covenant, he's saying, not one dot, not one iota will fade away when he talks about the law. You can either live according to the grace of Jesus Christ or you'll be measured by the law. And this is what God is saying in this context. They also had, right at the beginning of the sanctuary, as you came into the inner courts, there were two cherubim guarding the inner chamber, 15 foot high, each wing touching each wings, touching the ends of the wall so that nobody could pass into the inner sanctum without passing through these spiritual guardians and gateways and protectors of God's throne room. But I want to talk specifically about the eagle this morning. And let's read the psalm that we're going to be looking at, Psalm 61. The title of the message is, Lead Me to the Rock That is Higher Than I. Psalm 61. 
Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and to take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For you, God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Then I will ever sing in praise of your name and fulfill my vows day after day. Such a powerful psalm. It was written possibly at a time when David was not in Jerusalem. And if you look at the time, it was after Saul, it was when he was the king. There are two situations that line up in the Old Testament that could possibly be this time frame. One is him going out into battle, the kings of the Euphrates. The second, which is more personal, is when he had to flee from Jerusalem because his son Absalom had usurped the throne. And when I read this scripture, I realize very much for me, this is what I feel that David is experiencing at this moment in time. It starts off with a cry. Hear my cry, O oh God. Listen to my prayer. It's very important that we come to the realization that God hears prayers, but he doesn't always respond to them in the way that people would like him to respond. When I liken this psalm, I liken it to an eagle. And the first part of the psalm, I see it as an eagle that has been dethroned. It's no longer flying on the heights. He's come down to the depths. We were blessed a few weeks ago to go out to the Cotswolds. And when we went to the Cotswolds, we went to this a place that had birds of prey and they were flying all the birds out and the most majestic bird of all to me was the eagle. Even growing up, if somebody was to say to me, what is my favourite bird? There it is on the screen. It's the golden eagle. These birds have such wide wingspan. And this guy was talking about these birds as he was having them fly up in the air, and he talks about this eagle, and he says, well, it's a bit different from a pigeon. And you may laugh, but you know the pigeon is possibly the fastest bird that flies. The peregrine falcon is only faster because it's diving. But the pigeon, its wings flap so fast, it can change direction on a nutshell, it is the fastest bird that you could find through flight and through the flapping of its wings. But when it comes to this bird, this bird's a bit lazy. It doesn't like to use too much energy. There's a reason why it doesn't like to use too much energy. It's because it takes a lot of energy to get up to where it has to get up to. And it can see up to about five kilometers or three to five kilometers away from itself. So it has to get up high, and from that point it looks downwards on its prey. And it uses the air currents to get up to its heights. The problem is that the air currents have to be hot. If you have the wrong air current, then the bird can't 
glide up to the heights. And secondly as well, is sometimes it needs to take it in stages to get it up to the heights. And so you find these birds live in the rocks, live in the mountains, because they use the mountains and the ledges to jump off and soar on the air current. And you ask the question, well, how does this relate to David? We see, well, David, the city of Jerusalem was in the middle of mountains. Mountains were considered holy and sacred places. And the mountain of Jerusalem was even more holy because it had the temple of God on that mountain. And in that temple of God, they believed, and it happened at times, that the presence of God dwelt there. David had been kicked out of Jerusalem and he was dislocated away from the presence of God. He was in trouble. He was in need. And that's why he speaks in this psalm very much particularly, I am at the ends of the earth. Can you hear my cry? O oh Lord, I've lost the privilege of coming into your presence. Can you hear my cry, O oh Lord? Because it's a cry of mercy. The reason he's in this predicament is because he sinned. He slept with Bathsheba. He had Uriah killed. And then as a consequence, what happens was the child that was of Bathsheba died. But then his own son, Ammon, raped his daughter, Tamar. And Absalom was angry that he did nothing about it, so Absalom took it into his own hands, murdered Ammon, kicked David out of the throne room, and slept and raped all of David's wives. And David is in this catch-22 situation between being exiled because of his sin and all the things that he's done wrong, but at the same time, his love for his son. And then his love for God. And he's crying out to the Lord, he's saying, Lord, I don't deserve you to answer my prayers. I don't deserve you to answer my prayers. When an eagle cries, it cries for two reasons. The first reason, it's in distress. It needs help. The second reason is to warn other eagles of the enemies. And David sings this song and he's given it to be played on a harp and a winged instrument. He wants God's people to know that when you're in times of distress, you need mercy. Or when the enemies are at your gate, you are to call upon the Lord wherever you are. Whether you're in the presence of His throne room, in His holy city, with his church, with his people, or whether you find yourself alienated on the outside. The problem we have today is prayer is not being done properly. This is how prayer should be. It's a cry. It's a call for help. There are other ways of Handling prayer, we find in Acts 9, 13, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. And we know what happened in that story, don't we? Jesus we know. Paul we know. But who are you? When our prayer lives start to treat Jesus as if he's a genie or a magic word, we've lost the power. The true power is relationship in prayer. 
It's about calling on your Father. Whether you're in the matter of sin, or whether you're trying to actually fight against the enemy. And having that relationship then empowers your prayer to walk the walk that you have to walk. To deal with the situation and the circumstance. And to also realize that God is not answering your will. Because we flip that on its head, don't we? When we say, you know what, you know, I've prayed God is going to do what I want. Lord, give me a Mercedes. Lord, give me the nice house on the hill. Lord, give me a beautiful wife. Lord, give me a good job. We're asking the Lord to fulfill our desires, which is idolatry. It is also what witchcraft does. Because we see the word that is used of these Jewish exorcists, they invoked the name. And if you look at witchcraft and what witchcraft does with powers and spirits, it invokes the name of the spirit or the power so that that spirit and the power will imbue you with power and strength to do what you have to do. And Jesus is saying, and God is saying, and David is saying, it's not about power. Not by might. Not by power. Not by strength but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And where does the Spirit dwell? Is He out there in the ether? Is He somebody that we call upon in times of prayer? No, He dwells in us. Remember who you are. Who God has called you to be. We are not called to be wimps. We are not called to be quiet church mice. We are called to reflect who God is and what God has done. And so when I'm talking about the eagle, remember, you are not a sparrow. You are not a pigeon. Stop trying to act like the ravens of this world and learn to soar on the right currents. Test the wind. Where is the wind blowing? Who is the wind? It talks in the Bible about two types of wind. It talks about the Holy Spirit, and we find that in John 3, 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. In other words, if you want your life to be all nicely e ordered and tainted out, you know what, you're in trouble. The Spirit can speak to you in a whisper and immediately you're somewhere else. Just like Philip, he's running alongside the eunuch, teaching him all about the Gospel and the next minute he's being teleported. The Spirit has moved him somewhere else. But there is another end. There is another Spirit. And it talks about him as well in Ephesians 4.14 and Ephesians 2.2. 2. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. The main context of this scripture is the knowledge of Christ and the maintaining of his gospel which he has kindly written out for us. That we have the choice to read the good news of what Jesus has done from the beginning all the way to the end. Don't be deceived by those who try to edit the Bible. Try to miss bits out because it doesn't agree with what they feel comfortable with. The truth is the truth. And the truth will set you free. Because the Spirit is in the truth. And it's this combination of the wind and the rock. The wind being the Spirit, the rock being His Word. His Son. His presence. Because the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. 
So we have the physical and we have the spiritual. Beautiful analogy, even in this psalm, it talks about the rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, but I'm getting carried away. Let's go back to the wind again. The other scripture that we find in Ephesians 2.2, 2, in which you used to live, the way in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So there's two winds. There's that which elevates the hot air thermals that the eagle needs. And there's another wind where you're going to be striving. Can't get up to the heights. Can't quite get there. Oh no, worry. Oh no, fear. Oh no, anger. Oh no, all these other things that I'm trying to do in my own strength, but we're not called to do things in our own strength. We're called to do it in the power of the Spirit to soar. You know, one of the beautiful things when he was showing this eagle flying was that he showed that the eagle would start off trying to find the highest vantage point it could. So it flew up to the highest vantage point and it waited until it felt the currents were right. Then it would take off from that, try and get onto the currents and the currents would lift it up high. But as the eagle was trying to get up higher, all of a sudden you had all these ravens and crows starting to attack the eagle. It was vulnerable while it was at the lowest moments. And we see here that David is vulnerable in his lowest moments. He's vulnerable because he sinned. He's vulnerable because there are those who hate him and what he represents. And he's so trying to get back up to the heights, but he's being distracted by all these things that were coming at him. And the reason why the ravens try to stop him from getting the heights is because it's competition for food and the land and dominance of the skies. There is a competition going on. And it's not with your fellow believers, although that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to make his people fight against each other because that's half the battle. There's a competition for the attention of the whole world. And you can even listen to the voice of those who have the so-called power and authority. Or you can listen to the voice that has the power and the authority. A while back I was preaching, a long time ago, and I had this analogy, and I, on this analogy I had a, a sheriff's badge, and I pinned it on my chest, and I went through the preach, and I was going to use it to talk about authority, completely forgot about it. So everybody's wondering, well, why was he wearing this, this sheriff badge? So somebody came up to me afterwards and said, why were you wearing this sheriff badge? And I said to him, I said, well, because... You can have the sheriff badge and people can think that you're a sheriff. That you have power and authority. But the truth is, it's just decoration. It's just for show. And there are people out there who act as if they have the power and the authority to speak about things which they have no knowledge of. Well, we could talk about scientists, for example. We could talk about evolution. We could talk about the Big Bang Theory. But the truth be known, none of the people who talk about these things were there in the beginning. Only God was there in the beginning. And he speaks very clearly about what happened. Let there be light. And there was light. The earth was form and voidless and the waters covered the sea. Let there be land. Let there be male and female. God's voice, very clear. Wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Husbands, lay your life down for your wife. Some things we don't want to hear in God's word. But the example that God sets takes away striving, takes away fighting, 
and allows us to fly on the heights. Which comes to the next point, the perch and safety of the rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For you, God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. It's a beautiful example of the tabernacle in the midst of the mountains and how blessed God's people were to have the presence of God dwelling in amidst them. And that they had the freedom and the ability to come towards him and to sacrifice to him and have relationship with him. And David is getting sentimental because he's not in that place. He's longing again for things to be restored. The way that they should be. The way that they should be. He's looking forward to that restoration that is going to take place. God is going to restore that which is broken. And you may not feel like it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Because it's Him who has declared the restoration. Another example of prayer and somebody who did not want something to happen and was expecting God to change what was going to happen, but he still had to go through the suffering, is Jesus Christ. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, Lord, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I don't know what situation you're facing, what circumstances are happening, but we need to get back to that sense of prayer which really wants to know what God's will is. And we need to forget what our will is half the time and ask the question, God, what is your will? Your kingdom come, not my kingdom. And David has an eye open to the fact that actually it's not his kingdom, although he's king. It's God's kingdom. His presence is in his holy mountain. His tabernacle is there. And David is saying, I give it all up. The authority, the power, the strength, everything that I have as king of God's people, if I could just come back into your presence, Lord. Just gaze on your holy mountain. See your dwelling. And be restored back to you. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, even as we said about this presence, this tabernacle, the presence of these angelic beings that guarded the sacred places, that kept guarding God's people. One person it talks about in the Old Testament is the angel Michael. You know, in Jewish tradition, there are four angels which are archangels. Uriel, Raphael, Gabriel and Michael. But in the Bible, there's only one mention of an archangel. And that is Michael. And if you look in the Old Testament as well, you find that the word archai, which is in Greek, is symbolic of the high. Just like you only have one high priest. You have the high angel. And Michael was the one who fought on behalf of Israel. The one who contended with God. And this archangel was so powerful, he defeated the enemy by himself. He took the dragon and threw it down in Revelation. God could have done it with just a word. 
a whisper. But it shows that even his servants are more powerful. We've got to believe it, church. Even his servants are more powerful than the kings of the world. They truly believe the power that God has invested in each one of us. Just like the twelve, they became many. Because they had the right perspective of who God is and what God could do. But not only that, they laid down their own wills so that his will might be done. Humility is the key to the kingdom. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I cannot do this in my own strength. I need the vantage point. I need the perch that gives me the perspective of all the things that are going on in my life. I need to submit them to the will of God. And I need to be just like my Lord Jesus Christ where I say, nevertheless, your will be done. Even if I have to drink of the cup of suffering, pain, and death, your will be done. Why? Because I do not fear those who can kill the body, but I fear the one who has power over the soul. The spirit, the eagle that flies and drifts. I want to end with the dominance of the skies. Dominance of the heavens. When the eagle gets up to the place where it's supposed to be, it is the king of the skies. The ravens that were attacking it when it was down at the low are now victims of the one that flies overhead. And they dare not interfere with an eagle from the front on. You know when a raven attacks an eagle, it comes at the back. Because it can't see. It doesn't come at the front. And it doesn't just do it by itself. It does it in a flock. Because it doesn't have the strength to take down an eagle by itself. But the eagle, once it's in the, sky, in the front and it's on the heavens, it's got its talons ready. Woe betide any ravens. Woe betide any other bird that's in the skies. For when the eagle sees its prey, whoosh, the power, gone. Increase the days of the king's life. When we talk about the king, there's only one king. His name is Jesus. He's already done this. This is almost like David is speaking prophetically. Because he's the king. Now we say always well, talking about himself, but he's saying as if in the third person, increase the days of the king's life. He's not just looking at his own heritage, his own kingdom. He's looking at the future that God has promised to him that there would one day be a king who would sit on his throne. And he would rule on that throne for eternity. And that's the messianic promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Increase the days of the king's life. His years for many generations. How many generations have been gone since Jesus has been sitting on the throne? Many generations. Come back, Lord. We want you back. This was the heart cry of the church. Come back, Lord. We want you back. We want you back now. Now all of a sudden the church has got like, you know what, come back after I've got married. Come back after I've made my fortune. Come back after I've bought the car I've always wanted to buy. No, come back, Lord. Let this be our hearts cry every second of the day. I don't care what the world has to offer me. I want to be at your feet, Lord Jesus. I want to be giving praise and worship to you. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Beautiful. Daniel chapter 7. There is a man sitting at the right hand of the Father. 
Doesn't that blow your mind? You know, when we die, we lose our bodies and our spirits go to be with the Lord. It talks about the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews. But our bodies die and they're buried and they've gone to sleep and there's a sense that actually we're still waiting for our bodies to be resurrected. The first resurrection is the spirit, the born again experience. The second resurrection is the flesh. But already there is one who has been resurrected in the flesh. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And your love and faithfulness protect him. Then I will ever sing in praise of your name and fulfill my vows day after day. Give me a revelation of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done so that I can make a promise. I can make a covenant with him that I will forever sing his praise and fulfill my vows to him day after day. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 29. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And then Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Shall we stand, church?